These are air handler units, or industrial air conditioners the size of a small school bus. This is half of an air handler unit flying through the air. It's going to land on top of this building and suck hot air and steam from the rooms down below, make that air cold again, and then shove it back down to the same place that it came from. It's my job to run the piping that supplies these units with water and glycol. I'm going to use most of these fittings to do that. I'm Drew, a traveling welder and pipe fitter. I'm going to show you how these units work and then show you exactly how I go about piping them in. Now let's get right into it. This is the suction side of the units. Large ductwork will come from the building down below and connect to the underside of these units. That's where the hot air goes in. Watch carefully as I have an aneurysm trying to open this door. As if doors with one handle weren't confusing enough, this door has two handles. That's nearly double the handles. Let's take a look inside. The vents you see on the end of the unit will allow outside air to be sucked in and mixed with the hot air from below. This motor spins the fan which forces air through the unit. If you look behind door number two, you'll see where the hot air and steam get sucked in from below and pushed through the dingle flapper here. This is a damper that is controlled automatically. Behind door number three, we have the filter housings. Filters will go there and stop particles from heading inside the building. And finally, we see the first cooling coil. These work kind of like your car's radiator, except instead of the air cooling the coolant that keeps the engine cool, the coolant in these coils is cooled by chillers on the glycol side and the cooling towers on the water side. Those are located elsewhere in the plant. A lot of the industrial piping that's done in these plants is related to heat transfer, uh, whether we're talking a, a boiler which makes steam and then pushes that steam throughout the plant to heat exchangers and anything that needs to be heated up, or the chillers which cool down coolant and pumps send it throughout the plant to anything that needs to be kept cool. One way or another, heat transfer is a big part of my job. Now if we open this door, we are between the two coils. The one on the left is the tower water. The air will go through this one first to be cooled down a little bit. Next, the air hits the glycol coil on the right. Glycol is the main ingredient in your car's antifreeze that keeps it from freezing. This stuff is just a different percentage of glycol. The freezing point of pure glycol itself is much lower than plain water, but when mixed with the right percentage of water, it can drop as low as negative 60 Fahrenheit. Also, when water freezes, it expands, but when glycol freezes, it actually contracts. So adding glycol to a system can actually help prevent pipes from bursting, and that glycol coil will cool the air down the rest of the way before it exits the unit. And lastly, the air is pulled through this opening by another fan and discharged out of the unit into supply ductwork, and cold air is sent back into the building below. Now let's open up this cabinet and take a look inside. So what we have here is another oh, good heavens! wrong door. This cabinet is actually on the other side of the unit. And this one's for all of my utility piping that supplies the coils with water and glycol. The water coil is now on the right and the supply goes in the bottom port, filling the coil up to the top and then it returns out of the top port. Same story with the glycol on the left. Supply in the bottom and return out the top. All the ports you see on that bottom rail are condensation drains. Any condensation from this whole process will run out of those ports. That'll get piped with CPVC down into the building where it'll get pumped into their water systems and reused. The piping will enter through the bottom of the cabinet in three inch carbon steel schedule 40 pipe and return down through the floor of the cabinet as well. My welder Corey and I have run about six to 700 feet of pipe from the roof penetration over to each of the units where they enter the cabinets. There are three of these new units, by the way, and I will be piping in all of them. This is a PNID, or piping and instrumentation diagram. It shows all the piping that I need to fit inside this cabinet. A PNID is not a scale drawing. It just shows me the order of the valves and instruments and designates pipe sizes, direction of flow, and so on. On the supply side, we have an automatic control valve that can be opened and closed remotely followed by a butterfly valve on the glycol side. On the return side, we have a three inch brass circuit setter or a circuit balancing valve, as well as these temperature elements. These two lines get tied together in the cabinet, so the customer is capable of deadheading the water side and pushing glycol over to the water coil, running glycol on both sides. Most of the time, these valves will stay shut and the coils will stay separated. 
Also note the direction of airflow on the PNIDs is left to right, but in the units it's actually right to left, so I'm going to have to mirror all of my piping as I build it. Now that these circuit setters and control valves are bolted onto the flanges that are screwed onto the 4 inch threaded connections, I can start the rest of the piping down through the cabinet floor. After a day of measuring, sketching, and doing math, I have six separate ISO sketches. Uh, one for supply and return on all three of the units. If you're interested in more details on the pipe fitting side of this, let me know in the comments. I could make a dedicated pipe fitting video if there's some interest. So after running the Ellis saw, beveling, and end grinding for what seemed like days, Corey and I were finally ready to tack everything together. And this is all of those pieces ready for weld out. Between the three units, there are roughly 180 three inch welds just inside the cabinets. That should keep Corey busy for a few days. Thankfully, most of the welding can be done down here on the bench, and there are a few position welds. The last thing I want to hear is Corey whining and moaning because he has to do exactly what he gets paid to do. And trust me, he does. Most of these will be flanged connections that get bolted together inside the cabinet. The piping to these units is just low pressure. It's not getting x-rayed or DP tested. So we're just going to give them an eighth inch gap. It's an open root weld, uh, Sked 40 carbon steel. Like I said, Corey's getting full pen on the root with 332 wire, followed by an eighth inch hot and an eighth inch cap with ER70S-2 wire from Blue Demon. Only the best for Corey. As you can see, he's running the Blue Demon Game Changer TIG gloves also. You definitely want to try those out if you haven't yet. They are pretty nice TIG gloves. He's using the Maxstar 210DS plugged into 240 to make these welds. Also, if you see any tools or consumables in this video, like the Blue Demon gloves, wire, or anything else, it's most likely in my Amazon storefront, which is linked in the description below. I've organized my tools, consumables, and equipment onto this page so you can find them quickly if you're interested. While he's welding those up, I'm up in the cabinet screwing together these half-inch stainless steel drains and vents. On the bottom, I have low-point drains with a hose connection so the coil can be completely drained if need be. On the top side of the water coil, I have an air bleed to get all the air pockets out of the coil when it fills up, and that tees off to a vacuum breaker. I hole sawed 24 6 inch holes in the top and bottom of the cabinet floor for penetrations. I finished running the pipe down below the cabinets. As you can see, the insulators are coming right behind me. The ones with the inch and a half insulation are the glycol supply and return. The other two, or the tower water supply and return, and those will get one inch of insulation after they get heat traced. That heat trace prevents the water from freezing in the winter. Corey's almost done with the weld out, so I start installing the pieces, and once it's all installed, it should look exactly like this. I just need to grab a few field measurements down through the floor, cut and make a couple welds inside and below the cabinet. I cut some two by fours to temporarily support the piping, because that's a lot of weight hanging off of the copper coils, at least until the pipes are tied in down below and the clevis hangers below the unit are holding that weight. We cut some pieces and make position welds in and below the cabinet, and now we're all tied in to the pipe rack. Back inside the cabinet, bolts are tightened, gaskets in, valve handles installed, and the welds are painted. Just like the PNID, we have Supplies coming up through the floor here. Water and glycol pass through these control valves, can be open and closed remotely, depending on what the system needs. The coolant fills the coils and returns out the top ports. Uh, these are temperature elements that give feedback to the system. The brass circuit setters are here to balance the system out. And finally, the coolant returns down through the floor and back to the utility rooms below. And this is what it looks like with about 90% of the insulation on. Look, if you don't want to see any more videos like this one, be sure to not subscribe. That is the best way to let me know not to waste my time in the future. Ask questions in the comments or over on my Instagram. I try to respond to everyone. Till next time, I'm Drew and I'm Building America.